rumor roundup because we got to do this at the start of every show nowadays because there's always fresh rumors that comes out. This one is um, following up on a report that came out earlier in the week that Five Family is changing agents. Um, it's now been reported by Mark Stein that Fred will be signing with Clutch Sports. Um, you know, to me, that wasn't necessarily too surprising because once Chris Haynes was the one who broke the news that Fred was changing agents, kind of had an inkling of where it might go. Um, just yep. just based on the fact that Chris Haynes has a very, very strong history of reporting um, news around Clutch and, and Clutch clients. Um, but yeah, Vivek, your reaction to this? Yeah, I think it, it just says that, you know, Fred is getting everything in order for the summer. Okay. Um, if anything, I think he is probably pretty confident about what's going to happen at the deadline and says, okay, this is the best move for me in the summer and figuring out uh, exactly what the best possible avenue is, whether it's staying with Toronto or pursuing a new team in free agency. Okay. Um, when, when you're seeing the amount of teams that have been linked to Fred, and, and who knows, right? At this time of year, it's really just peak, like, throw whatever is out there. It could be smoke screens from teams. It could just be speculation. It could just be loose reporting of, like, hearsay that becomes reported and then becomes sort of like a big thing. You, you don't know at this time of year, right? Clearly, there's a there's a mm -hmm. lot of info that gets out there. But you have heard a lot of teams interested in either trading for Fred Van Vliet um, at this deadline, or presumably, if they're interested in trading for him now, they're probably also interested if they have the cap space to then go uh, make a move in the off season. Um, does, does the relative? I don't know. It, it feels like there's a lot of teams interested in Fred, um, and and you know he. I think the perception here and, and the experience here has been, you know, he hasn't had the greatest season. Although his numbers are really slowly coming back, it's very close to where they were last year. Um, does that surprise you that there is still this strong uh, and, and this robust of a market for Fred? Not necessarily. I think the teams that are interested probably view Fred uh, as a piece that they need, not like, you know, a top two piece. I think that's where the difference is, right? Like if you're looking at Fred saying, hey, you need him to be the number one guy or the number two guy, then you know you're probably not talking about winning a championship mm -hmm. and so i think when you look at the teams uh that might be out there whether it's orlando building forward whether it's the clippers trying to you know stabilize themselves at the point guard position like they have other pieces in place right, right? right. um even if you look at uh, a team that's rumored like phoenix right mm. i think that puts Fred in the best position to succeed, I think, on a championship team. And so I think that's how they're probably viewing it, where the load that he's having to carry with the Raptors is going to be alleviated, and that will bring out the best in him. And with the shooting struggles, I mean, we've already seen him trend the right way. They probably view that more of as uh, an anomaly and that his body of work in the NBA speaks to him just being a very good three-point shooter flat out and someone who again you take away the load that he has right now in toronto maybe he does return to what he's capable of defensively yeah no that's fair um you know, I, I mean to be honest I, I don't know if phoenix is still like a title contending team i know they went to the finals as recently as two years ago but yeah it just to me it's like so much of that was chris paul and if you're if you're signing or if you're trading for fred um that probably means you're moving on from CP, right? So, and mm -hmm. and and Fred's very good, um, but I mean Chris Paul is literally the point guard, right? And and what he did over the course of you know the the last you know two three years here with Phoenix, um, especially in the regular season, but even at times throughout the finals and stuff like that, like you know he's he's the main driving force there. Um, yeah, I guess it doesn't surprise me either. Um, you know, it, it's not like there's a lot of available point guards out there, you know. Um, and yeah. even though I think. Uh, Fred hasn't had like the best season that that he probably anticipated. You could clearly tell there's some, you know, frustration and ups and downs over that. At the end of the day, it, it's still a pretty decent season when you're looking at it. Uh, when he goes <laughs> into free agency, I, I'm not surprised that uh, there be teams interested. Um, speaking of teams interested, OJ and Obi. Um, so the report came out from Ian Begley that the Knicks registered interest in OJ and Obi. Um, you know, sometime he didn't really specify when, but it, it seems to be within this season. Um, I believe the offer that he described in passing was sort of multiple picks 
for fourth um, OG. Maybe, who knows? The Knicks are a team with tons of uh, extra picks. They could be one of those teams um, that had offered three picks for OG. We saw that report as well from Bruce Arthur of uh, the Toronto uh, Stars. So, yeah, I mean... The Knicks as a, as a fit for OG and Obi, would you would you feel comfortable trading OG to you know a team that you're literally going to face four times a year? Is that a factor at all for you or no? <laughs> I think if you get back a significant return, um, then you just consider it, right? Mm-hmm. I, I don't think you know Masai Ujiri thought about having to face the Knicks four times a year when he traded away Andrea Bargnani. So uh, I think if you get the right value in return, then you just do the deal, and so. With OG Ananobi, obviously, the Knicks, you can see the the fit. Like, he would slot into that starting lineup next to RJ Barrett and Julius Randle and Jalen Brunson really nicely. Mm. Um, and so, you know, it, it's something that you consider, but obviously, that's not what the Raptors are looking to do right now. They're looking to still evaluate and, you know, potentially have a piece that is ready to go right now because i don't think the raptors are going to be inclined to just take picks and think about the future Mm. um and if there's i think a ready-made piece that's a different type of piece that can come back plus you you know you get some uh picks to stock the cabinet then i think you probably consider it more seriously yeah i agree with you i I think um yeah, especially if you're gonna again, there, there's there's no I, there's no real um, interest in ever trading Pascal Siakam at, at when he's playing like this. Um, I know that you know people might speculate in terms of okay, if the Raptors fully go in the tank, they might go in that direction. They're not going to do that. Um, so as long as you have him around, as long as you have a competitive base around, honestly, as long as you have Masai around too, like I just really don't see them pivoting into sort of that full on like just take all your players right now and trade them for future pick style, but. You know, at the same time, like, yeah, I think with OG, you know, if you were to make more trades, I feel like uh, if you were to move him, for example, I think Memphis, um, you know, I, again, there's no specific link between those two teams. Um, but I'm just looking at it on paper. They have the type of players where you get immediate yep. prospects and who, who potentially could step into a bigger role while also getting some future assets um, in addition to 